Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anurekha Chari Vag, Assistant Professor at the Department of Sociology, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. Today we are going to discuss the paper titled Agrarian Structure on the Eve of British Rule, Part 2. This paper is part of the larger discipline called Agrarian Relations and Social Structure in India. This paper is coordinated by Dr. Manish Thakur of IM Calcutta. Today in this module titled Agrarian Structure on the Eve of British Rule Part 2, we are going to look into the works based on the works of the economic historian. Further, we are going to focus on the special works of Burton Stain, H. Fukazawa and Irfan Habib. Further, we are going to look into the problematic issues that is facing rural India, especially rising rural indebtedness, economic differentiation among peasantry, exploitation of agrarian surplus. What is very important for us to understand is that many of the problems that we are facing in rural India today, we have also faced in British India, that is even before the British rule came into India. Agrarian structure on the eve of British rule 2. As mentioned in module 2.1a, the nature of Indian economy before the British conquest has been a matter of intense debate among the historians. The latter has been interested in knowing if the economy has had such elements that would have led to subsequent development of capitalism in India. Alternatively, the question has been if capitalism had to enter the economy in India, it had to necessarily depend on the colonial intervention. Based on such historiographical literature, we present in this module an overview of agrarian structure on the eve of British rule. This module heavily reproduces the work of H. Fukazawa in his presentation of the agrarian structure of Maharashtra and Deccan. It does the same for South India in relation to the work of Burton Steen and of course Irfan Habib, the eminent historian of Mughal India, is present in each and every sentence concerning Mughal India. The assumption here is that an understanding of the agrarian structure in Mughal India, South India and Maharashtra and Deccan implies an approximate understanding of Indian agrarian structure on the eve of British rule. Aspects of agricultural production in North India. Economic historians generally agree that Indian agriculture was characterized by the large number of food and non-food crops. In terms of sheer range of crops produced, the Indian peasants were distinguished from their counterparts in other parts of the world. The peasants elsewhere were confined to a very few crops. For ex instance, the N.A. Akbari gives revenue rates for 16 crops of the Rabi spring harvest cultivated in all the revenue circles of the Agra province with three others not cultivated in some and 25 crops of the Kharif autumn cultivated in all or but circles. In each locality, as many as 41 crops were being cultivated within a year. A similar multiplicity of assess crops appears in the N.A. Akbar rates for other provinces. Not only did the Indian peasant go, grow a multiplicity of crops, but he was also prepared to accept new crops. The 17th century saw the introduction and expansion of two major crops, tobacco and maize. Both were immigrants from the new world. The rapid expansion of, rapid extension of tobacco was spectacular. Its cultivation had begun on the western coast soon after 1600, but by 1650 it was been cultivated in almost all parts of Mughal Empire. Historians like Irfan Habib underline the mobility of the peasantry as an interesting feature of agriculture during Mughal times. Habib quotes Babur who says in Hindustan, hamlets and villages, even towns are depopulated and set up in a moment. If a people of the large town who have lived there for years flee from it, they do it in such a way that it is not a sign or a trace of them remains in a day or a day and a half. On the other hand, if they fix their eyes on a place in which to settle, they need not dig water courses or construct dams because all their crops are in grown. A group collects water, they make a tank or dig a well, they need not build houses or set up walls, casts, grass, abounds, trees are innumerable but straight away there is a village or a town. Abundance of land was another characteristic of the prevailing system of agricultural production. Large areas of virgin land were available in most regions during the 16th and the 17th centuries. The desertion of the old lands and settlement of the new appears to be common practices undertaken by the peasants organized in communities. In some cases, perhaps individual peasants too shifted the cultivation. 
Habib mentions a category of peasants designated Padishikt who cultivated lands in villages other than their own. This may not have been a common practice though. Also, there was little change in the average productivity of land during the three centuries, 17 through 19. According to Habib, it is possible that productivity per head was higher in 1595 than around 1870 or 1900. Given the greater availability of land with the means of cultivation remaining the same, the average peasant holding of 1595 was more likely to approach the optimum size than that of the 1900. Also, as discussed in the earlier module, Indian peasantry was economically high, stratified and considerable difference existed in the size of the holdings, produce obtained and resources of the prisons within the same villages. On the one hand, there were big prisons or headmen, mukaddams, who organized khudasht, cultivation under their own management. They employ laborers as their own servants and they put them into the task of agriculture, making them plow, sow, reap and draw water out of the well. They pay them with their fixed wages, whether in cash or grain, while appropriating to them the gross produce of cultivation. At the opposite end were small peasants engaged in the cultivation but dependent wholly upon borrowing for their subsistence and for seed and cattle. If the absolute size of the agricultural product or even the per capita per product in Mughal India was impressive, it does not necessarily follow that agricultural production was carried on at a smooth pace or an even pace. On the contrary, there were two factors, one natural and the human, which created serious interruptions of wall and setbacks for agricultural life. The first factor was climatic, essentially the untimeliness, scarcity or the superfluity of rain. The dependence of Indian agriculture on the monsoon is proverbial. In the absence of adequate means for transporting grain in bulk, mortality in each major famine, which was often accompanied by pestilence, was frightful. During the 1630-32 famine in Gujarat, 3 million people are said to have died. In the years 1702-1703 and 1703-4, 2 million people are said to have died of starvation in the Deccan. These figures in themselves are guesses only, but are still important as they are showing the immensity of mortality as it appeared to the contemporaries. Gujarat famine of 1630-32 caused a lasting dislocation to the economy of the region. The villages were utterly depopulated and when they began to fill but slowly late in, nine, in 1634, the peasants who had survived abandoned cotton cultivation for food. The marks of the famine were visible in 1638 and even by 1647 agriculture in Gujarat had not fully recovered since the revenues of the province had not yet reached the level attained before the famine. Second factor to consider is the impact of the system of agrarian exploitation. It has been argued that since the land revenue covered practically the entire surplus produce raised by the peasant and that since representing a fixed share of the produce or a fixed cash rate on, on the crop per unit of area, it was a retrogressive tax. It fell ex excessively heavily on the smaller peasantry. In addition, the system of Jagir transfers encouraged an unchecked violation of the peasantry by the potentates. It resulted in the large-scale abandonment of land by the peasants. With famines as recurring setbacks to agricultural production, the Mughal agrarian exploitation as a factor of constant pressure upon peasantry. It would perhaps be reasonable to rule out any spectacular increase in the extent of cultivation during the Mughal period. There were areas that were reclaimed from the waste of forest as in the Terai or Eastern Bengal, but such reclamation did not exclude the simultaneous process of depopulation in other areas. Agricultural Production and Relations in South India Some of the most important features of agricultural production in South India were tropical climate allowing agricultural operations throughout the year, the more even distribution of rains than in northern India, combination of southwestern and southeastern monsoons, which to an extent made it really possible to vary dates of sowing and harvesting of some crops, large quantity of unoccupied lands, absence of land starvation, and on the contrary, a shortage of labor, the great expenditure of labor for bringing into cultivation the new lands. The construction of an irrigation system usually was beyond the laborer resources of a single household and hence undertaken by a village or a group of villages. In the 17th and the 18th centuries, the representatives of central power and the local officials were often seen as organizers of the construction of reservoirs, canals, etc. than before. Irrigation was considered a work of religious merit with the result that during all the known history of southern India, 
we find inscriptions and detailing the construction of tanks, dams, etc. Yet in most part of southern India in the beginning of the 19th century, only 3 to 7 percent of the cultivated territory was irrigated. Only in Tanjore, where the conditions of irrigation were especially good, it, this ratio was nearer to 50 percent. Irrigation management in medieval period was often uneconomical. Tanks and canals were neglected and abundant perhaps as often as they were constructed. The main crop on wetlands was paddy, the most important food grain of southern India. Each householder, even a marginal peasant, had to use additional labor. This additional labor was sometimes provided in the form of peasant cooperation, but also in the form of laborers from depressed untouchable caste. This, there was a considerable group of landless laborers who were forced by the social and economic dependence to work in the other's household. Historian Dharma Kumar has estimated that at the beginning of the 19th century in Madras presidency, um, agristic laborers mainly from the untouchable caste numbered up to 15 percent of the population and 7 to 25 percent of the agricultural population. They were comparatively less numerous in Rayal Sima, Brahmahal, Mysore, but in eastern Tamil Nadu and in Kerala, the untouchable labor had relatively more importance. The small peasant household based on personal labor of the householder was but one of the production unit in agriculture. Widespread to some extent were also two other types, that is the large peasant household with the householder taking some part of the work but mainly dependent on the regular inflow of additional labor and the type in which householder directed the work of the laborers dependent on him attached to the land. The Indian social system reversed the influence of economic factors. The deficiency of labor force was to an extent connected with the fact that an appreciable part of the population from high caste considered physical labor as degrading and some agricultural operations as forbidden and constantly sought to avoid personal participation in the production process. The main food grain was rice, but the millets, cholam, ragi, varagu, etc. occupied a comparable area. Rice was at the same time the most important commodity. The poorer strata of the population sold the rice they produced except the part taken in kind as tax. In order to buy ragi and cholam for their consumption, other commodities were pepper produced mainly on the Malabar coast, chili, oil producing crops such as sesame, flax, groundnut, cotton. In the inscriptions of the 16th and the 17th centuries and earlier, village bazaars and fires are mentioned where the retail trade in rice, bitter leaves, pulses, ragi, oil, pepper, milk, jaggery and artisan goods took place. But the connections of the rural population with the market did not yet create a commodity production system. The agriculture continued to be essentially natural as the reproduction of its labor implements are going on inside the village community on the basis of natural exchange between the artisans, the blacksmith and the carpenter and the cultivator. Thus, the system of agriculture developed and traditionally consolidated in southern India was extensive in principle, oriented to labor saving and not to land saving. It assured a definite rather high level of agricultural productivity, but the further increase on the basis of the same system was impossible. With the growth of population and cultivation of the worst lands, this system was sure to suffer a sharp decline in its productivity as happened later on. The system of traditional services by artisans who produce agricultural implements as well as widespread use of dependent laborers were not interested in the results of the labor, were the great obstacles preventing an intensification of the methods of production. The medieval Deccan and Maharashtra. The village of the medieval western Maharashtra were, was called Gavna from Sanskrit Grama, Mauje from Arabic Moza and or Persian Deh. These terms were used interchangeably, but formally Mauje was prefixed to the proper name of the village. A bigger village containing a marketplace was called Kasbe. The villages as a rule took the collective form of habitation. There the village site was called Pandri and usually surrounded by earthen walls. Outside the village site there were agricultural lands called uh, Kali. It is said the people originally inhabited the white soil unfit for cultivation and turned the black soil widely found in the Deccan into the agricultural fields. Beyond them were the village common or the grassland, generally wasteland for cows. The grassland meant for common use of the villagers was termed people's grass, grassland and that for the fodder used by government was called government grassland. Agricultural land was divided into perhaps 20 to 40 blocks. Uh, and each of the block had a tenor name 
that was probably the surname of the original proprietor or colonizer. Each block was composed of fields variously called set or jamin. Occasionally, san Sanskrit word bhumi was also used to mean the fields. To put the manor another way, Kali would be divided into ordinary owned land, gifted or exempted land, state land variously called or treasury land, land of the exempt families or on the other hand village would consist of hereditary village officers such as headmen, accountant, assistant headmen, proprietary presence, temporary presence or tenants, village servants and artisans. While the headman was usually of Kunbi caste, which was later assimilated into the Maratha caste, the accountant was generally a Brahmin because of his literacy. Village officers used to own more than less, more or less large land and be allowed by the government to have some imam land as well. Moreover, they were entitled to enjoy certain rights and privileges to receive some amount of produce from the peasants and village artisans. The office and the accompanying imam lands as well as privileges were called watan, which was not only heritable but saleable and transferable with acknowledgement of state authorities and village assembly. On the other hand, Mirasas present, mostly Kunbis by caste, were permanent residents of the village and bore the regular revenue and miscellaneous cesses for the state on the Miras land in which they held fairly com complete proprietary right. Though it was not a frequent practice, they could sell their own land from the late 16th century. Village servants and artisans called Balitadas included the carpenter, blacksmith, potter, shoemaker, rope maker, barber, washerman, astrologer, temple keeper, mosque keeper being butchers as well and, and so on. The composition was fairly common, uniform throughout the number of number varied according to the size of the village. They were expected to serve the villages whenever required in their respective capacities fixed by the caste and were paid the remuneration at two harvests of, of the year usually in kind but occasionally in cash, such remunerations being called balute. Besides these, they were entitled to certain shares of the offerings dedicated to village temples and to some other prerequisites on special occasions. Moreover, many of them were given the village small land of Inamdan, which was as a rule cultivated by themselves. On the other hand, like the peasants, Palitadas were divided into permanent and temporary residents of the village. The right to serve and the right to receive various remunerations of permanent Palitadas was clearly recognized as a Mirazar Vatan. Hence, Mirazar Palitadas, their myths were heritable and transferable. The temporary Palitadas were naturally entitled to receive awards rewards so long as they worked in the village but were called Upar Balatedas and not recognized as Mirasdas. In fact, the Balatedas were not employed by individual present families but by the village as a territorial whole. They were broadly three method methods of paying remuneration to them probably corresponding to different types of payment of land revenue to the government. First method corresponded to the um, birth system. All prisons bought their respective produce to a certain place in the village and gave customary shares of it to each category of Balatadas. The second method was in the line of the system where each peasant paid a certain fixed amount of his produce to the state after, invest, after inspecting the state of the harvest. The village headman got every peasant to pay a certain proportion of his produce to each category of the Balatadas. And the third method was when revenue was paid in cash, where each category of Balatadas would receive a certain amount of cash. At any rate, each category of Balatadas was considered to hold one Vatan per village and the amount of remuneration was fixed per Vatan. When a Vatan was shared by several families of the same occupation or the caste, what was divided was not the sphere of work but the remuneration for the Vatan and the lump amount whether in kind or cash was to be divided among themselves. Assembly would decide village affairs such as dispute over land rights, disposal of wastelands and so on and attested the uh, transfer of land and land rights in Vatan. It sometimes intervened in caste matters of village though there was a separate caste assembly for members of each caste residing in the same region. Village was responsible to the state for arresting criminals, compensating for value of goods stolen or tracing them as far as the next village. Despite the fairly stable structure of the village community, considerable economic differentiations among peasants were the reality. This could have been there owing to a variety of reasons and the revenue system, state promotion of cultivation, system of inheritance, individual availability of capital, labor, natural as well as man-made calamities. 
Peasants were not only divided into Mirazdas and Oparis, but were also comparatively well to do and poor. From 10 to 200 villages formed a sub district called Apargana and so on, and each sub district had one or several hereditary chiefs and the hereditary accountants, the former being usually peasant by caste and the latter as a rule the Brahmin. At any rates, the zamindari system of the North Indian types was generally absent in the Deccan. Also, hereditary officers of the sub-districts were not the sole holders of land and village in Inam. King and Pesh was of the Marathas as well as preceding Muslim kings of the Deccan used to give wasteland as Inam to distinguish servants of the state noted temples, monasteries, mosques in addition to hereditary officers of sub-districts and villages. The more important of them were given the villages in Inam and Inam was a free rule free from revenue though sometimes slighter revenue called Inam Patti was levied. The holders of villages and large lands in Imam generally exercised feudal authority on the people on the lands. Government sometimes encouraged the construction and repair of dams and wells and gave money to those who were willing to do so. Those peasants who actively responded to the state encouragement of the cultivation of wasteland seem to have been Uparis rather than Mirazdars. The large proportion of revenue more or less assigned to the officials and aristocrats in the medieval Deccan states. In Deccan Muslim Kingdom, the high class officials and the nobles as well as middle class officials were as a rule temporarily assigned the revenue from a certain region. Such assignments being called Mukkasti. These assignees and especially the large ones exercising wide administrative power over the assigned areas were virtually in a position to collect as much as possible through their agents. Much like in the North India, the general structure of village in the medieval Deccan was fairly uniform and stable. Also the size of land holdings among the peasants fluctuated considerably because of national and political situations. As a consequence, there was remarkable economic differentiation among the peasants. In medieval Deccan, there seems to have been a conceptual distinction between tax and rent corresponding to different categories of agricultural land. At any rate, the revenue was assessed and levied usually in cash or on different crops and soils. At a more fundamental level, the southern and western parts of the country did not have the type of zamindari rights that were so characteristic of Mughal and North India. In this module on agrarian structure on the eve of British rule in India, part 2, we have seen how important were their important dimensions with regard to the agrarian structure. Especially we focused on three important aspects of agrarian structure. We looked at agricultural production in North India. We looked at agricultural production and relations in South India and also the medieval Deccan and Maharashtra. Based on the works of very eminent economic historians as already mentioned above, we have also looked into how contemporary increasing rural distress such as indebtedness, impoverishment, expro expropriation of surplus by the of the peasant by the other rich classes have also been experienced even in the agrarian structure in pre-British India. So therefore, it is very important to look at historically some of these issues that are emerging today. Thank you.